Hello, everybody. I am John Allen, your host here on Last Week in the Church. This is a show where we sort of pan for gold in the river that was the last week, or in this case, the last two weeks since I was off last week. So the last fortnight on the Vatican Beat, looking for those few nuggets of gold that you can glean from everything that has gone on. Here's what we've got for you this week. We begin with unhappy anniversary. Over the weekend, the world marked the two-year anniversary of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, the failure to date of all diplomatic efforts, including those of the Vatican, to resolve the conflict were abundantly clear. And in fact, there is a new factor coming into view that may further complicate the Vatican's attempt to play peacemaker. We'll explain what it is and why it might matter. Second up this week, we got Dr. Doctor, give me the news. Pope Francis is forced both on Saturday and on Monday to cancel the events on his schedule due to what the Vatican is describing as light flu-like symptoms without fever. We'll bring you the latest and greatest on the ever-popular papal health front. Third, we have got a dream deferred. Five years ago, Pope Francis convened a important summit on fighting the clerical sexual abuse scandals in the Catholic Church with promises that a new day was dawning, but two victims of a prominent accused abuser came forward this past week to suggest that rhetoric is largely hollow. We'll explain what they had to say and where things might go from here. Fourth, of reforms and revolutions. So Pope Francis's ongoing Synod of Bishops for Synodality is scheduled to reach its crescendo this October here in Rome. In the meantime, there are new signs in Western Europe out of Germany and Belgium that the forces unleashed by the Synod may be escaping the control of the Pope who unleashed them. And finally, this week, we've got wise guys. A couple of Catholic priests in southern Italy once again are facing threats and backlash for their spine in standing up to the Mafia. All that and more is waiting for you on this edition of Last Week in the Church, so please stick around. This is our official Last Week in the Church infomercial, because I come to you with a special offer for all of those would-be Catholic eggheads out there. That is, if you're the kind of person who likes sounding smart, who likes creating the impression that you know things other people don't, that certainly describes me. If that describes you, you're going to want to know about this. Now, I've already spoken about this new app, this new online resource called Magisterium AI. Basically, what it allows you to do is to type in a question like, what does it mean that the Pope is infallible? Or what does the Catholic Church teach about the environment? Or, you know, whatever. And it will give you a short, smart, easily digestible answer based on more than 5,000 official magisterial texts. But Recently, these guys have created a new feature on the app. It's called the Scholarly Mode, which draws not just on official texts, but also the best and brightest of Catholic thinkers and theologians over the centuries, from Augustine and Aquinas to more contemporary figures. And we'll also give you a very quick answer about what those folks have had to say about what the church teaches on various issues. Now, I promise you that if you try this once, you're going to wonder how in God's name you ever lived without it. It's brought to you by our friends at Longbeard. They are the digital marketing design company that provide the IT backbone for Crux. They provide the same service for a slew of other Catholic organizations and outfits. They are they're brilliant, and they are creative, and they are tremendous. And I'm kind of out of adjectives at this point, which is saying something, because I traffic in adjectives. But I am telling you, these people are the absolute level best. So check it out. This is Magisterium AI, their new scholarly mode. You're going to dig it. Magisterium.com, that is Magisterium.com. It comes with my personal guarantee. All right, everybody, happy Tuesday to you. Happy Tuesday, February 27th in the year of our Lord, 2024. Thanks for being with us. I apologize for being away last week. I was on the road in the States, but I do want to give a quick shout out to my hosts, 
The Religious Education Congress of the Archdiocese of Los Angeles held in Anaheim at the Convention Center, and also St. Bruno's Parish in Whittier and Padre Serra Parish in Camarillo, both part of the university series. I gave four talks over four days. You were all magnificent hosts. I had a blast. Thank you for having me. Hope to see you again next year. All right. We begin this week with a very unhappy anniversary. So Saturday, February 24th, was the two-year anniversary of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And one thing that was abundantly clear as the world marked this lamentable milestone is that to date, the diplomatic efforts of all parties to resolve this conflict have essentially flopped, failed, gone nowhere. The United Nations has made no progress. China floated a peace plan, went nowhere. Prime Minister Narendra Modi of India has tried to intervene, gotten nowhere. And on that list of unsuccessful efforts to play the part of peacemaker is also the Vatican under Pope Francis. Of course, along the way in this conflict, Pope Francis has appointed a special troubleshooter for the conflict in Ukraine, that is, Italian Cardinal Matteo Zuppi, president of the Italian Bishops' Conference, and a veteran diplomatic negotiator from the community of Sant'Egidio. Zuppi has made special diplomatic forays to Kiev, to Moscow, to Washington, Beijing. Sometime soon, he is scheduled to go to Paris to meet with French Premier Emmanuel Macron to discuss the conflict. And yet, none of that effort has borne any particular fruit. In fact, even with the more modest humanitarian goals that Zuppi was compelled to adopt along the way, that is helping to return some of the kidnapped children from eastern Ukraine who have been removed by Russian forces, even that has had only limited success. And so, at this 2U mark, the question is, is there hope that anyone is going to be able to step into this breach. I mean, at the moment, it seems unlikely that that might be the case because the truth of it is, neither Russia nor Ukraine right now is interested in a peace deal. They both still believe they can prevail on the battlefield or at least shift reality on the battlefield significantly in their favor when some kind of final status resolution is reached. Now, when a moment comes when one or both sides is interested in some sort of exit strategy, the question is, Will the Vatican be positioned to play a constructive role? And at one level, you might say, well, they ought to be. You know, on the one hand, Pope Francis has made his sympathy for the plight of the Ukrainians clear from the beginning of this conflict. He never speaks in public these days, not once ever, without appealing for prayers for what he calls martyred Ukraine. On the other hand, from the very beginning, the Vatican has also refused to be enlisted in the anti-Putin, anti-Russian sort of alliance of the Western powers. In fact, the only time Pope Francis has referred to Putin in public since the conflict began, he has called him a man of great culture with whom he has has had interesting conversations on literature. He has publicly praised Great Mother Russia. He has suggested that Russia may have had legitimate security concerns, such as NATO barking at its door that helped set the stage for this conflict. He's condemned the role of Western arms dealers in fomenting and exacerbating the conflict to move their product. All of that has earned him political capital on the Russian side. So you might say the Vatican is in a great spot, but here's the problem. If the Vatican is actually going to try to mediate this conflict, when it comes to the Russians, that effort would to some extent have to go through the Russian Orthodox Church, that is the Vatican's natural dialogue partner, on the Russian side. And of late, a new front, a new sort of Cold War has opened up between the Russian Orthodox and the Vatican, not over any of this geopolitical stuff, but rather over what you might consider an eternal ecclesiastical matter, and that is the document Fiducia Supplicans from the Vatican. That's the December 18th document from the Vatican's Dicastery for the Doctrine of the Faith that authorized the blessing of persons in what the Vatican euphemistically describes as irregular relationships. Now, what that literally means is anybody who, whose relationship doesn't quite live up to the full Catholic ideal of what marriage is supposed to be. 
Now, ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you, I've been married most of my adult life. Most of the people I know were married. I've never seen a single relationship ever that isn't irregular in some way. But nevertheless, that's the vocabulary the Vatican uses. And of course, most prominently, most controversially, this set of irregular relationships would include people who were in same-sex unions. Now, that has generated a firestorm of controversy in the Catholic world. We've already talked about that on this show. But of late, it has also drawn blowback from the Russian Orthodox side. Over the weekend, a statement from a biblical and theological commission of the Moscow Patriarchate indicated that at the instruction of Patriarch Kirill of Moscow, the leader of the Russian Orthodox Church, this commission examined fiducia supplicans and concluded unanimously that it represents a sharp departure from Christian moral teaching. This is on top of the fact that the head of that commission, Metropolitan Hilarion of Budapest, the former number two official in the Russian Orthodox power structure, earlier gave an interview in which he said that he had experienced a kind of shock when fiducia supplicans came out, and he described it as a deception. He said it's going to create the impression that the church now blesses same-sex relationships, he said that deceives the people in these relationships, and it deceives the people who witness these blessings. In other words, we have now a conflict between the Russian Orthodox Church and the Vatican, which is not related to the war in Ukraine. It has to do with the Pope's internal ecclesiastical agenda, and yet that internal agenda is now complicating his external efforts to make peace in Ukraine. In other words, it might make things even more difficult if and when a moment should come that for other reasons, the Russians and the Ukrainians might be interested in having the Vatican play a mediating role. We'll see how it all plays out. All right, second up this week, doctor, doctor, give me the news. I got a bad case. Well, not of loving you, but of not feeling so well, basically, is Pope Francis's situation. On Saturday, again, the 24th of February, the Vatican put out a statement that due to light flu-like symptoms, which did not involve fever, the Pope was going to be canceling his audiences that day. Now, so far as we know, there was only one appointment on his schedule. It was with the deacons from the Diocese of Rome, which means they live here. They're not going anywhere. That can be rescheduled anytime you want. And nobody got all that worked up by it because on Sunday, then, the Pope delivered his traditional noontime Angelus address as scheduled. And as my wife Elise, our superstar Vatican correspondent at Crux, with her customary verve and elan reported on our site, the Pope on Sunday seemed fine. His voice seemed strong. He seemed alert, engaged, in good shape. I mean, if the Vatican had not announced the day before that he was sick, there would have been no indication of it on Sunday. However, yet again, then on Monday, which, by the way, is the day we are taping this show, so as we speak, the Vatican once again has announced that due to the persistence of these light, flu-like, non-fevered symptoms, the Pope is also pulling the plug in his activity on Monday. He had no publicly scheduled appointments on Monday, but Whatever these appointments may have been, he's not maintaining them. Now, is this a five-alarm papal health scare? No, absolutely not. Because, remember, it was bracketed by his appearance on Sunday where he actually seemed quite fine. However, it is a reminder that this is an 87-year-old pontiff who, over the course of the last year, 2023, was in Rome's Gemelli Hospital three different times including a couple of bouts with bronchitis and a surgery to repair an abdominal hernia. This is on top of the fact that he continues to suffer from sciatica, that painful nerve condition that makes it difficult for him to stand or sit in one spot for very long. Of course, he had part of one lung removed as a young man, and he's still got that bum right knee from a case of arthritis that for reasons that surpass human understanding, he just stubbornly refuses to have dealt with surgically. And so that means he is occasionally constricted to use a cane or to use a wheelchair in order to get around. Now, however, none of these conditions are life-threatening. And, you know, we have to remember that we have been down this road before in terms of papal health scares. I mean, 
you know, John Paul II used to joke when people would ask him how he's feeling. His answer always was, I don't know, I haven't read the papers yet today. His point being that the media would often blow up every little hiccup. And, you know, we've been down this road before with Pope Francis too. I think the only conclusion we can probably draw, the only responsible conclusion is, look, given his age and the challenges he is facing, anything could happen at any time. On the other hand, there is absolutely no indication that we are in some kind of in-game scenario right now. On the contrary, this is a pope who seems determined to get through the Senate of Bishops in October. He's already announced that he wants to make a couple of international trips this year. And of course, next year, he's got the great jubilee of 2025. Will he be able to make it through all that? Only God knows. Does he want to? It certainly seems so. And if you believe in mind-body relationships, if you believe that where there's a will, there's a way, my advice, don't count him out. All right, third up this week, a dream deferred. So it was five years ago in February when the Vatican, in conjunction with Rome's Jesuit-run Gregorian University, that of course is the Pope's own Jesuit order, convened a high-profile summit on the clerical sexual abuse crisis. And the rhetoric was that the days of denial and cover-up are over, that we have to embrace a new pledge, a new stance of transparency and accountability. This summit was intended to kickstart that process of turning over a new leaf. In the period since, Pope Francis has issued a series of new pieces of legislation intended to lend teeth to those promises, including, perhaps most prominently, a document called Vos Estis, which for the first time in the life of the Catholic Church created a system of reporting and prosecution, not simply for the crime of sexual abuse, but also for the cover-up of that crime. That is, created a way to report bishops and other superiors in the church who were believed to have dropped the ball, to have mismanaged, or to have knowingly covered up these crimes. And all of that has been packaged, presented, and spun by supporters and acolytes of Pope Francis as evidence of historic reform when it comes to clerical sexual abuse. And yet, and yet many observers would tell you that there remain troubling cases that raise hard questions about whether the new system that has been created is fully effective. Perhaps none more so than the case of Father Marco Rupnik, former Jesuit, who is one of the most celebrated artists, most celebrated muralists in contemporary Catholicism. His art blends elements of Eastern and Western Christian spirituality. It adorns various high-profile spaces, such as the Redemptoris Mater Chapel in the Vatican, the Lourdes Shrine, the National Cathedral in Washington, and many other venues beyond. What has happened since 2021 is that an ever-increasing set of adult women, most of them either current or former religious, have come forward to accuse Rupnik of various forms of abuse, in some cases sexual abuse, in some cases psychological abuse, abuse of authority. And for the most part, those accusations have been anonymous. News organizations have protected the confidentiality of the accusers. But the new development this past week was that two of these Rupnik accusers, who had previously been identified only by pseudonyms, have come, came forward publicly in a news conference here in Rome, accompanied by their lawyer, Laura Scro, who is a very well-known figure on the Vatican scene, has represented clients in the Swiss Guard murder. She represents the Rolandi family in the Vatican Girl saga. She also now represents these Rupnik accusers and they came forward to tell their stories. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm not going to go into great detail on this program about the precise nature of what they alleged that Rubnik had done. Suffice it to say, it is disgusting and appalling, and if half of it is true, it raises deep questions about what the hell was going on in this community of nuns known as the Loyola community, for which Rupnik served as the kind of advisor, spiritual patron, and 
whatever guy in charge. Now, the, the real question raised by all of this, however, is how has Rupnik up to this point been able to, for the most part, escape culpability? Remember, he was briefly excommunicated for the crime of absolving an accomplice in sexual sin, but that excommunication was lifted in just a couple of weeks after it was issued. The Vatican initially ruled it could not prosecute Rupnik for anything else because these crimes did not involve the sexual abuse of a minor, and therefore the statute of limitations applied. The Jesuit order then conducted its own investigation, determined these charges were credible, they kicked Rupnik out, but an investigation commissioned by the Pope's own Diocese of Rome concluded that his center here in Rome, the Cento Roletti, had a clean bill of health. The Pope met with one of his most prominent defenders, but has yet to meet with any of his accusers. All of that collectively has created real confusion. Now, the most recent development is the Pope reversed course, lifted the statute of limitations so the Vatican could prosecute the case. However, and a Vatican statement this week indicated that the responsibility for doing so lies with the dicastery for the doctrine of the faith, despite the fact that that dicastery recently put out a statement saying it is not responsible for prosecuting cases of abuse of vulnerable adults unless they have some kind of mental impairment, which these accusers don't. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, it's kind of a mess. It's not entirely clear who's responsible or what they're doing. And in the meantime, these victims are saying they have been shown a cold shoulder by church authority. They do not feel that they have been taken seriously. They don't have much confidence in the system as it stands now and its capacity to do justice to their complaints. And so obviously the bottom line here is all this raises very real and very thorny questions about whether the great promise of reform that we heard five years ago has actually been delivered in the real world. Again, we will have to keep our eye on this. To date, the Vatican, although it put out a statement in tandem with this press conference saying that a castor of the faith is responsible for the Rupnik prosecution, we have not been told who in the dicastery is actually handling this case, which charges are being examined, what sort of timeline is envisioned, and when some sort of determination might be expected. All of that remains unknown, and clearly these are questions to which not just Rupnik's accusers, including these two brave souls who have now put names and faces to their accusations, but the wider Catholic world. These are questions to which we are all going to want answers. All right. Fourth up this week, we have of reforms and revolutions. So the centerpiece of Pope Francis's internal reform agenda, that is having to do with the internal life of the Catholic Church, is of course what is known these days by the buzzword of synodality. Now, synodality is a notoriously elastic and difficult to define term. In fact, when I was on the lecture circuit last week, every time I spoke, I challenged anyone who could stand up and deliver to me a crystal clear definition of synodality in a single English sentence, I would give them a shiny new dollar I never had to pay off. But in broad strokes, I suppose, what it means is a church that is more participatory, more inclusive, more tolerant, and more accountable, okay? And this whole process, which began four years ago, is designed to reach its kind of climax with the second edition of a Synod of Bishops on Synodality here on Rome, here in Rome this October. The Vatican recently announced the dates. The Synod will meet October 2nd through the 27th. It will be preceded by two days of retreat, September 30th and October 1st. Now, you know, fans of this process will say this is the most consultative undertaking in human history. It signifies a new era of a listening church in which everyone's voice matters, and it has surfaced a whole plethora of important issues for the life of the church, which will lead to sweeping reforms, which will transform Catholicism and lead it into a brave new era. Now, critics of this process, on the other hand, will argue, well, they'll say many things. I mean, in part, they will say this is a sham of listening because some voices have been excluded. But one criticism they will make is that by creating the idea that, in a sense, you know, everything is possible, right? That there are no more taboos, no more closed doors. 
that Pope Francis may have set in motion revolutionary forces that even he himself can't control. And there were a couple of developments this past week that might lend at least some credence to that concern. One is that the Vatican was forced once again to intervene with the Catholic Church in Germany, a letter co-signed by Cardinals Pietro Perolin, the Vatican Secretary of State, Victor Manuel Fernandez, the Prefect of the Dicastery for the Faith, and American Robert Provost, Prefect of the Dicastery for Bishops. So the heaviest hitters the Vatican has got, short of the Pope himself, directed to the German bishops, basically told them while they were meeting in Augsburg for their plenary meeting, that they could not vote on proposals to establish a new synodal council, that is a governing body for the church in Germany that would be composed of both laity and bishops and in which actually the voice of bishops could be effectively swamped by the lay members. There are 70 member body, only 23 bishops. So, and you only need a two thirds vote to get something passed. So actually the laity on their own without a single bishop signing on could actually under the proposed structure, push proposals through that would be binding for the Catholic church in Germany. The Vatican told the bishops, you can't do that. As a result, the bishops did delay their vote, but they hardly said, that they were throwing in the towel. In fact, Bishop Georg Beitzing, president of the German bishop, said, we're going to continue to press for this. We may have to, you know, pause, hit the pause button right now because of this Vatican intervention, but we are not giving up because we think this will enhance our credibility, not detract from it, enhance our authority and not detract from it. In any event, the point is the Germans are saying, we are going to try to press ahead. And this is clearly something that Pope Francis has tried to tell them they can't do. He has said publicly, such a structure is not envisioned in canon law. You can't do it. They're trying to do it anyway. Meanwhile, in Belgium, the Bishops' Conference put out a statement ahead of the October Synod intended to guide discussion in the Belgian church in which the bishops themselves basically suggested, you know what, maybe we might want to press for women deacons, that is the ordination as of women as deacons in the Catholic Church, and also for an expansion of married priests. First, there already are a limited number of married priests in the Catholic Church, particularly with the 23 Eastern Rite churches in communion with Rome, but the Belgian bishops were suggesting something bigger and broader than that, essentially making celibacy optional also in the Latin Church. Now, We don't exactly know where Pope Francis stands on either of those two issues, but we do know that he has had ample opportunity to pull the trigger on those two reforms up to this point, and he hasn't done it. The point is, in the German case, it is a clear example of somebody trying to go farther than the Pope wants them to go. In the Belgian case, it is at least arguably another instance of people pressing beyond the Pope's own agenda raising the question of whether the Pope has started something that he's not going to be able to stop. Again, we will see. Finally up this week, on Saturday, again, lots of stuff happened this past Saturday. On Saturday, Father Felice Palmara, who is a parish priest in the southern Italian region of Calabria, head of a small parish, had an unpleasant surprise as he celebrated the Sunday Vigil Mass, went It came time for him to lift the chalice to his lips to drink from the consecrated water and wine. Father Palmara detected a strange odor in the chalice, and he stopped the mass. The police were summoned, and it turned out that Palmara's instincts were right in the money. In fact, somebody had attempted to poison his chalice with bleach in an obvious effort to either kill or injure Father Palmara. This comes on top of the fact that he has faced a mounting campaign of threats and intimidation. On at least a couple of different occasions, his car near the parish has been defaced with menacing graffiti and, you know, people putting in scratches and gouges and puncturing the tires and so on. He's also had a series of anonymous death threats, letters delivering death threats that have shown up in his mailbox. And he's not the only one. The priest pastor of a nearby parish, recently went out for dinner, went out to have a pizza with some friends in the village square, and when he went back to get into his car, found that somebody had killed a cat and left it 
on top of his hood in what is widely understood locally to be a kind of veiled message, well, not so veiled message, really, that you might be next. All of this because these two priests are well known locally for being outspoken opponents of the Comore, that is the Calabrian version of the Mafia. These priests are advocates of legality, of playing by the rule of law. They've attempted to persuade locals, particularly young people, to resist the lure of organized crime and instead to not be afraid, denounce crime, to speak publicly to law enforcement, and so on. Obviously, that message isn't particularly appreciated by some in their neighborhood. Let me point out that the region of Italy where they live is currently under a specially a government-appointed police commissioner because the mayor was forced to resign last August because it turned out that the mayor was taking orders from the mob. So for their trouble of standing up to this climate of organized crime, these priests are in the crosshairs. Another reminder that sometimes being people of faith isn't just empty rhetoric. Sometimes you put your life on the line. Kudos to these guys for their willingness to do it. All right. That is our show for this week. You can find full coverage of all these stories on the Crux site, cruxnow.com. I will be back here next week, same bat time, same bat channel. In the meantime, stay safe, stay healthy, have a fantastic and blessed week. We will talk to you again very soon.